Modern Chinese History 2 Rebuilding During the Republican Era 1920-1937 With the Demise of Yuan Shikai, the Republic Encountered Difficult, Perplexing Conditions. Real power of the central government was exercised by numerous local warlords. Japan used military threat to widen its influence. The Soviet Union worked with both revolutionary parties. The GND and the Chinese Communist Party, CCP, and forged an alliance between them with the goal to rebuild a central government that would be amicable and open to Soviet influence. With the support of the Soviet Union, the Northern Expedition was carried out in 1926-1927 to unite China and Chiang Kai-shek defeated and co-opted the most important warlords. He broke the alliance and banned the CCP. When China was reunited in 1928 and a new government came into power in the capital Nanjing, nation-building became an overwhelming priority. The term, nation-building, refers to centrally initiated and coordinated efforts or programs to modernize an economy and society, homogenize a population, elevate ideals of popular sovereignty, produce a progressive conception of history, create an unmediated and interiorized relationship between citizens and nation-state, and force congruence between a territorial state and culture. This meant building a range of new institutions to bolster the new revolutionary republican system and keep it in operation. Much was achieved in China in terms of nation-building and institutional reform, but these achievements were largely confined to the urban areas. By contrast, the CCP territories were located in unruly, unstable, and impoverished regions of the countryside far from the coastal cities. They became the stage for a reboot of the revolution. Fleeing from its former main base in Shanghai, the communist movement had to reinvent itself as a peasant revolution. Instead of strikes, it engaged in armed uprising. Land distribution displaced worker control over factories as the top priority. However, the CCP was deeply divided about the fundamental policies. Bloody party purges followed. Disunity also made the territories vulnerable to GMD attacks. Toward the end of 1934, the CCP was on the run again, and began its long march to Yan'an in Shaanxi. 1. China under warlord rule apart from the external pressure of imperialism. The internal crisis of warlordism was robbing China of its future. Warlords were autonomous militarists who gained power through the devolution of military authority from the central state to the provinces or regional leaders. Finally caused the massive breakdown of central control after 1916 with the failure of Yuan Shikai's death. Thereafter, a power struggle arose among Yuan Shikai's former generals of the Beiyang army. These generals, commanded personal military forces and acted independently of central authority. As the Beiyang warlords jockeyed for power among themselves, regional warlords assumed power in other parts of China as well. The period between 1916 and 1928, when a new national government was eventually re-established by the GMD in Nanjing, saw the rise of numerous regional rulers, almost all of them with military backgrounds. Fighting among warlords was almost constant. While it gradually lost its power over much of the country, the Beiyang government maintained control over the capital, Beijing. Through coalitions with other warlords, it also controlled parts of North China. The Ministry of Foreign Affairs continued to represent China in international politics. The Beiyang government was also the recipient of customs revenues. The Beiyang government even continued institutional reform, especially in the education sector and the legal system. It defended Chinese interests in foreign policy and negotiated a raise of the customs tariffs with the great powers. Given the many warlords and the considerable diversity of their policies, it is difficult to characterize the era as a whole.
With these men in command, the period tended strongly toward violence and heavy extraction of resources from society. Zhang Zongchang, who was referred to as the dog meat general, because his favorite game was called eating dog meat, had a reputation for violence and womanizing. He ruled over Shandong in the 1920s, but also made several advances into the south. He briefly held Shanghai and Nanjing in 1925. Feng Yuxiang had the nickname Christian General, since he was known for his missionary zeal after converting to Christianity. He rose to power as a warlord in China's tumultuous north. With a main base in Shaanxi, he pursued a program of social and economic improvement for all members of society, impoverished or wealthy. He vigorously suppressed prostitution, gambling, and the sale of opium. Some other warlords, such as Yan Qishan, the model governor from Shaanxi province, also pursued long-term stability and economic development in the areas under their control and cared for the welfare of the population. Thus, for most of the warlord era, there was no clear basis for political legitimacy and despite their coercive power, the warlords oversaw inherently unstable regimes. Because most of them were strongly committed to the region they ruled, but harbored little concern for China as a nation, they also undermined the central institutions that had been in place. Without a single currency, a unified national administrational system, or a unitary system of national defense, China became increasingly fragmented socially, politically and economically. The single exceptions were the post office and the maritime customs service, both of which, amazingly, continued to work throughout this era. In the treaty ports, schools and universities expanded and operated with little restriction. The foreign dominated cities along the coast offered protection not only from predatory warlords, but also from Japanese expansion, giving rise to diverse, creative, bourgeois, and cosmopolitan cultures. Commercial development mainly centered on the treaty ports also penetrated rural economies, especially in coastal locales. In fact, in the post-war period, Chinese companies and trading houses made enormous profits serving Western demand for raw materials and agricultural produce. With the revival of trade in the 1920s, China also experienced growth in the small, modern sectors of the economy along its coast. As evidence of this period's rapid pace of industrialization, Modern factory production grew 8 to 9% annually in the 1920s. The industrial labor force numbered some 2 million people, a quarter of them in Shanghai. Chinese banks increased in number and expanded their capital. Many new laws were passed to govern the economy in various ways. It is remarkable that the build-up of a new economic institutional order in the coastal areas proceeded strongly despite political turmoil. The warlord era fundamentally undermined the concept of civilian rule in China. The military became a leading institution, and it preferred military solutions to problems of control and governance. Meanwhile, the political situation created serious potential for outside intervention. Two, United Front Revolution inspired by the global flows of ideas facilitated by the May 4th movement. China's students and activists began to study Western political ideas seriously. Above all, 
the split of the new culture movement into liberal pragmatism and left-leaning revolutionaries, and the deepening crisis in China propelled Chinese intellectuals to search for an international alternative and more potent solution. Young intellectuals were at first attracted to the ideas and activities of the Russian nihilists and terrorists who were mostly informed by the political philosophy of anarchism. The calculated use of violence for political ends advocated by the anarchists seemed necessary to many young Chinese at the time. In a nutshell, anarchism favored the autonomy of local communities and opposed monarchy, imperialism, and any kind of nationalism that envisaged a large, centralized state enforcing its authority. The idea of local communities as the source of social order and economic well-being resonated with many Chinese thinkers, and many in this period echoed elements of anarchistic thinking. Already concerned with China's fragmented situation, more and more intellectuals came to view the Russian Bolshevik solution as more appealing and better suited to the problems of Chinese society. In contrast to anarchism, Marxism was considerably less known to the Chinese. In early 1903, a brief excerpt from the Communist Manifesto was published in China. Five years later, in 1908, Chinese anarchists published a translation of Friedrich Engels' preface to the 1888 English edition of the Communist Manifesto. This was the first Marxist text to appear in complete form. Inspired by the Bolshevik Revolution of 1917, Li Dajiao, known as the father of Marxism in China, was the first in China to draw attention to Marxism. In his essay, The Victory of Bolshevism, published in the October 1918 issue of New Youth, Li Dajiao welcomed the revolutionary new order of the Soviet Union and briefly discussed the Marxist social and economic theories on which it was based. Li Dajiao came into contact with Marxism through Japanese language writings. The Research Society for the Study of Marxism, he founded met regularly to discuss revolutionary theory. Only after the May 4th movement, and in the midst of general disappointment regarding Wilson's allegedly empty promises of self-determination, did many more Chinese students and intellectuals begin to study Marxism? What inspired the first Chinese communists was Leninism rather than Marxism. Most of these early communists were primarily nationalists. They were interested above all in China's national salvation. Recognizing this helps to clarify subsequent developments and the ultimate form that Marxism-Leninism took in China. Specifically, it explains why the practical principles and organization of the Soviet Revolution, more than Marx's original philosophical ideas, attracted the interest of Chinese communists. At this point, the Comintern, the Russian organization founded in 1919 to spread communism across the globe, decided to facilitate the establishment of a communist party in China. Surveying the scene from Moscow, Commenter agents determined that the group around Li Dajiao at Peking University was most likely to participate in such an undertaking. They also identified a group of intellectuals associated with new youth in Shanghai, including Chen Dushou and others, who could possibly form the nucleus of a new communist party. In August 1920, 
A communist group was set up in Shanghai, consisting of students, teachers, and journalists. From the autumn of 1920 to the first half of 1921, similar communist groups were established one after another in Beijing, Wuhan, Changsha, Jinan, Guangzhou, and other cities, as well as in Japan and France. In November 1920, the communist group in Shanghai drafted the Manifesto of the Communist Party of China. This first public text issued under the aegis of the Chinese Communist Party, CCP, consisted of three sections. Communists' ideals, communists' objectives, and recent conditions in the class struggle. It articulated the communists' aspirations to create a new society that would abolish private ownership. Practice public ownership of the means of production, destroy the old state apparatus, and eliminate social classes. The CCP was officially established in July 1921. When the first Congress of the CCP was convened in the French concession in Shanghai, attending the Congress were 12 delegates representing 53 party members from seven localities. Among these 12 were Mao Zedong and Dong Biwu, the party's co-founders, Chen Dushou and Li Dajiao, were unable to attend. Two representatives of the Comintern, G. Mering and Nikolsky, attended the Congress as observers. From the outset, the CCP defined itself as a Marxist-Leninist party, a revolutionary party of the working class, committed to socialism and communism. It was determined to ignite a revolution in China. Hence, the First Party Congress adopted a sectarian, strict proletarian line and refused any notion of cooperation with other social groups such as urban shopkeepers, merchants, or intellectuals. The program passed by the Congress called for the revolutionary army of the proletariat to overthrow the capitalistic classes. It demanded a dictatorship of the proletariat. The Congress elected Chen Dushou as general secretary. Li Da and Zhang Guoteo would together form the party's central bureau. This exclusive focus on the working class and hostility toward the bourgeoisie contradicted the policy favored by the Comintern. The subsequent period was dominated by Soviet attempts to compel the CCP to pursue a policy of cooperation with other groups, and in particular with the nationalists around Sun Yat-sen. The representative sent by the Comintern, Mering, was tasked with influencing the CCP to come into line with the Comintern plan. He suggested an alliance to the CCP by which it would cooperate with Sun Yat-sen's GMD. North and Central China were still firmly under the control of Bayong connected armies. The warlords viewed the GMD and the CCP with suspicion, if not hostility. By 1921, one of the few sympathetic warlords Chen Zhongming assisted Sun Yat-sen's efforts to head the GMD government in Guangzhou, reorganize the Nationalist Party, and build a revolutionary alternative to the Beiyang government in the north. The Soviet Union eagerly worked through the Comintern to back Sun's GMD. Subsequently, the Comintern sent an agent Adolf Jia, to Guangzhou to make clear that the Comintern would offer advice, money, and weapons, but only on the condition that a broad national alliance be established, including the small CCP. 
In 1923, Sun Yat-sen forged a coalition of nationalists, the CCP and the Soviet Union. Between 1923 and 1927, the GMD and CCP worked closely with the Soviet Union. A large contingent of advisors from the Comintern also advised on political matters and assisted the GMD's efforts to build a modern and strong army at the newly founded military institute, the Wampoa Military Academy. Revolutionary ideology played a prominent role in the academy's teaching program and emphasized the importance of political awareness. Chiang Kai-shek served as the first commander of the school and established a basis there for the almost exclusive control of the army. Chang was born in 1887 to a salt merchant family from the town of Zyko in Zhejiang province. Schooled in the classics, he was endowed with a deep sense of responsibility to engage in self-cultivation, maintain self-discipline, and observe traditional social rituals. Like many in his generation, he was driven by China's lost wars and the abolition of the examination system to join the military. Inclined to study military strategy, tactics, and technology, he enrolled in the Japanese military academies. In 1913, he met Sun Yat-sen in Japan and started to work with him. In August 1923, Sun sent Chang to Moscow to study military and party organization. So that when the Wampoa Military Academy opened, Chang was the obvious first choice for the position of commander. Zhou Enlai, later second in command at the CCP, served as its political commissar. The new Comintern representative, Mikhail Baradin, forcefully pushed the expansion of cooperation between the CCP and the GMD. The process was accelerated by promises of greater Soviet financial support and by the reorganization of the GMD that finally took place in January 1924. By 1925, Soviet support had made the Kuomintang into a very different and much stronger party. According to Comintern instructions, the main targets of the revolution were foreign imperialists and its Chinese collaborators. While fighting these opponents in cooperation with the GMD, the CCP was to strengthen its position within the GMD and more broadly within the nationalist movement by taking control of the peasant and labor movements. Baradin first wanted Chinese communists to ally themselves with the left factions within the GMD to increase their influence within the movement. The alliance was formally called the United Front. It helped the CCP to increase its membership and enabled communists to develop personal relations with GMD soldiers and officials in organizations such as the Wampoa Military Academy that would prove invaluable in later years. Wang Jingwei, who in the 1920s ascended into Sun Yat-sen's inner circle, worked with Zhou Enlai in the political department of the academy, where they devised propaganda campaigns. Between January 1924 and May 1926, communist influence in the GMD grew steadily and the CCP grew from just under a thousand members in January 1925 to almost 58,000 by April 1927. On March 12, 1925, Sun Yat-sen died, 
The almost immediate result was a power struggle between the left and right wings of the GMD. The right-leaning Chiang Kai-shek and the left-leaning nationalist Wang Jingwei. Chiang had started to doubt the usefulness of the alliance with the Soviet Union and grew convinced that the Soviet Union used the United Front to undermine the nationalist leadership. Chiang Kai-shek moved quickly to secure his role as successor. After officially becoming the leader of the National Revolutionary Army on June 5, 1926, Chiang Kai-shek went on to carry out the Northern Expedition first conceived by Sun Yat-sen as a core mission of the United Front aimed at reunifying the country. With the Northern Expedition, Chiang Kai-shek pursued two goals, hoping both to secure his leadership of the party and government and to eliminate the remnants of the Bayong warlord network that still controlled the large swaths of North China. In July 1926, National Revolutionary Army left its stronghold in Guangzhou to overpower the warlords. Soviet military advisors were attached to every unit of Chiang's expeditionary force. And Soviet aircraft and pilots flew reconnaissance missions over enemy positions. The Northern Expedition was a bitterly fought civil war that took the lives of perhaps 300,000 people. By March 1927, the National Revolutionary Army had overrun Hunan, Hubei, Yangshi, Buzhou, and Fujian provinces and captured many important cities, including Shanghai, Nanjing, and Wuhan in southern China. Once victory seemed within reach, Chiang broke with those forces that had provided crucial support. Chiang ended the cooperation with the Comintern at the end of 1926 and shortly thereafter banned CCP members from serving on GMD committees. On April 12, 1927, he decided to finally purge the party. Government, an army of all communists through brutal campaigns of extermination and bloody massacres. In January 1928, however, Chiang's troops occupied Wuhan and brought unified military governance to the whole territory along the Yangtze. On April 7, 1928, Chiang resumed his northern offensive against the remaining warlord forces. Many generals shifted their position either toward neutrality or toward Chiang Kai-shek. By the end of 1928, most of China had been brought under Chiang's control. Yet the successful completion of the military campaign was an impressive victory and important boost for Chiang Kai-shek. When he went on to eliminate known and suspected communists from within his party and from the cities under nationalist control, he pushed the communist party to the brink of destruction. 3. Nation building during the Nanjing decade by 1928, Chiang Kai-shek had done away with his main contenders inside and outside the nationalist party. He had reunited China and enforced the idea of a united republic. Chiang decided to place his government at Nanjing, the former capital of the Ming dynasty, which had been the last dynasty by a Chinese ruling house. Chiang's leadership, too was far from secure and continued to face serious challenges, especially in the period from 1928 up until the early 1930s. 
Occasionally large military battles between Chang and the various warlords looking to expand their sway or conspire against him. All openly revolted and tried to topple Chiang's government. Chiang's responses were equally violent and dubious. Espionage, covert activity, and assassinations, as well as large bribes to various warlords, contributed to Chiang's success in clinging to power. After 1927, most GMD leaders agreed on some broad political goals, including an anti-communist stance and a strong belief in a one-party system, the need for political centralization, and a high degree of control over society and the economy. In general, his authority rested on unstable coalitions of GMD supporters and regional allies. What these supporters had in common was little more than a fragile allegiance to Chiang Kai-shek as leader, or to the party itself, in theory. The GMD controlled the state and would rule through a system of so-called political tutelage. Political orientations within the GMD member base ranged from leftist to traditional to conservative. The Sun, Hung, Sung, and Chang families would remain at the center of a financial and political complex through the entire period of the Nationalist Republic in China. Chiang's rule also relied on the Chen brothers, Chen Lifu and Chen Guofu who headed the so-called CC clique. This group derived its power from within the party and, specifically, from the Nationalist Party's organization department, which ran the party from the national level all the way down to the grassroots and was modeled after the Bolshevik party structure. The CC clique asserted power by influencing appointments in the party and in national and provincial administration, and monitoring the press and other educational and cultural institutions. On Chiang's instructions, yeah. one of the Chen brothers, Chen Lifu, was also appointed to head an intelligence service called the Investigation Section of the Organization Department. Later, in line with his governing style of creating networks of rival organizations loyal only to him, Chang asked Dai Li, a former and trusted Wang Poa student, to head a new Bureau of Investigation and Statistics in the Military Council. The two intelligence agencies both engaged in covert operations against proclaimed and assumed opponents. Another faction was the Wampoa or Wangku group. Its members were mostly former military staff and students who had studied under Chang at the military academy. They dominated the Military Affairs Commission in command of the Nationalist Armed Forces and were fiercely loyal to Chiang Kai-shek. They also organized a group called the Blue Shirts to combat the ills of liberalism, corruption, communism, and the Japanese threat. The secret core of the association was the Lipsing She Act Vigorously Society. Ultimately reaching half a million members, it used security training, political indoctrination, mass recruitment, clandestine operations, the infiltration of regional warlord armies, and propaganda efforts to encourage defections from the communists. Chiang Kai-shek had two important inner-party rivals the left-leaning Wang Jingwei and the conservative Hu Hanlin. They continued to contest Chiang Kai-shek's hold on power. Only the growing threat by Japan compelled the two competitors to cooperate. After a short resignation in December 1931, meant to demonstrate that no other leader could replace him, 
Chiang Kai-shek returned to power in January 1932. Heading a new government in which Wang Jingwei, after uneasy negotiations, served as president of the executive Yuan. The nationalist government also undertook a number of significant initiatives and reforms to follow up on its agenda of reconstruction and national development. Some of those reforms were very successful managing to slowly improve China's international standing. China became an important member in international organizations such as the League of Nations. The Republic also moved to steadily reduce foreign privileges in China and make China a more equal trading partner through treaty revision and tariff reform. In 1930, the government succeeded in restoring tariff autonomy. It gained the right to decide the percentage of import taxes on goods coming into China. Also, during this time, the Maritime Customs Service that handled these tariffs started to replace foreign employees with Chinese. A number of foreign concessions were returned to Chinese control, for instance, the British leasehold in Shandong, Weihaiwei. The regime thus achieved some of the major goals that Chinese nationalists had set long before. As a result, customs revenue increased enough to cover about half the government's expenses, leaving the rest to come from industry and agriculture. After a lengthy process of discussion and political maneuvering in the early 1930s, the draft text of a new national constitution was published in May 1936. The constitution was explicitly based on the three people's principles. In fact, it declared China to be a three people's principles republic while granting political participation to the people. The Constitution clearly limited the fundamental civic rights of the citizens. Law and criminal justice were high on the agenda of the government in Nanjing. In general, the nationalists adopted all major legislation from their predecessors in the Bayong government but tried to modify and revise the laws to bring them in line with the new political and constitutional order. A modified version of the criminal code was made public in 1928. Revised criminal procedures followed one year later. Between 1929 and 1931, a modern civil code was adopted. An organizational law for Chinese higher education was approved in 1928. It required that each university should have a school of science, engineering, medicine, or agriculture. Reforms began in earnest in 1932 under the leadership of Zhu Jawa, who was named Minister of Education. By 1936, the number of universities and colleges had increased to 108 with 41,922 in school students and 11,850 faculty and staff. Those institutions were mostly located in the big cities in the eastern part of China. This dynamic and evolving system of higher education included public institutions, Peking University, Jiaotong University, National Central University, and a pure research institution, the Academia Sinica, complemented by a range of private colleges and universities, Tsinghua University, Street, Johns University, Peking Union Medical College, and Yenching University. As Chiang Kai-shek found himself surrounded by political rivals within the party, 
challenged by a swelling communist uprising, fighting unyielding warlords, and responding to a Japanese invasion in the early 1930s, he recognized the need to go on the offensive. It was imperative that he offer a compelling, guiding political idea, it could effectively counter the appeal of communism. In Yangshi province, where the communist Soviet base area was located. The New Life Movement was launched in 1934 and spread via posters, pamphlets, public lectures, and the organization of mass demonstrations. The movement used an eclectic mix of traditional and Christian ethics to facilitate a social and cultural transformation. A leaflet authored by Chang explained that the New Life Movement promoted a regular life guided by four virtues, Li, behavior, Yi, justice, Lian, integrity, and Kai, honor. From these rules, one learns how to deal with men and matters, how to cultivate oneself and how to adjust oneself to surroundings. New Life Instructional Committees were set up throughout the country and, by 1935, more than 1,100 counties had such committees. Gradually, the New Life movement became more militaristic. While it failed to entice the masses, it stands as first of the many large government-led mass movements that would become a hallmark of China's 20th century history. Mass campaigns also became an important tool for the communist government to rally the population behind its goals and to enforce policies. The organizational prototype provided by the New Life movement turned out to have more impact than any message it tried to deliver. The idea of a countrywide political campaign that bypassed the regular institutional order to quickly and flexibly realize political goals was a significant and far-reaching innovation that would play out after 1949 on a far bigger scale. Through initiatives like the New Life Movement, the Nanjing government also tried to control the public sphere. Sun Yat-sen had already envisioned the establishment of a propaganda state in the 1920s. The nationalist government under Chiang Kai-shek started in 1928 to pursue this motion, although it was never able to enforce complete control of public intellectual life. In a propaganda state, all forms of public communication are influenced and regulated by the state. The goal is to bring public life in line with the norms of state ideology. Accordingly, the Nanjing government censored the press and tried to influence public opinion through state propaganda. It also arrested or otherwise intimidated intellectuals who publicly voiced criticisms of the government. By the mid-1930s, then, the nationalist government had achieved a relative degree of consolidation, although it remained fiscally weak, politically vulnerable, and timid in face of criticisms but it could claim a fair degree of control over most of China proper. The economic heartland of the rice producing center and the industrialized eastern cities. It also had built new institutions that were striving to develop and transform China into an industrialized modern country. Western historians have long held a rather negative view of the achievements of the Republican era and its main leaders, Sun Yat-sen and Chiang Kai-shek. Recent research has developed a more positive and revisionist interpretation and provided a more sympathetic portrait of Chiang Kai-shek as a patriotic defender of China.
A balanced judgment must recognize that much was achieved of lasting significance for China's development, especially regarding institutions. Without doubt, despite all its failings, the Nanjing government was the most effective administration China had seen since the mid-19th century. 4. The rise of the Chinese developmental state if the GMD government's first priority was building a strong, defensible, and authoritarian state. Economic development and industrialization were second on its agenda. There was broad consensus within GMD circles that economic modernity was key to national recovery and China's national assertion. There were two diverging and competing concepts in play. The first was Wang Jingwei's and T.B. Sun's economic policy, which envisioned the development of a national economy. Combining state control with support for China's private sector. By contrast, Chiang Kai-shek favored the development of military-oriented heavy industry not only emphasized state control but saw the state as owner and manager of industrial enterprises. At the center would be heavy industrial development oriented toward the defense industry. In the mid-30s, with the growing Japanese threat, Chiang Kai-shek's ideas gained the upper hand. Also notable is that both concepts continued to have impact beyond the Republican era. Mao's emphasis on heavy industry in the 1950s was similar to Chiang's industrial policy in the 1930s. While the Deng Xiaoping policy after 1978 resembled the Wang Jingwei's early national and Minzu economy plans, in the 1920s, the Chinese economy had improved markedly and Chinese businesses, from textiles to tobacco, were thriving. But when the Great Depression took hold in the West between 1929 and 1933 and international trade collapsed, China's exports in silk, tobacco, cotton, and soybeans suddenly nosedive. Perhaps the most impressive, and certainly the most extensive, achievement was the construction of national infrastructure. Investments were made in much needed ports, waterways, highways, railroads, and airports. Projects in this sector were often made in cooperation with international agencies or foundations, including the League of Nations and the Rockefeller Foundation. In the decade leading up to 1937, China's paved roads doubled to a total of 115,000 kilometers. The railway system also improved as the GMD nearly doubled the lines to total some 25,000 kilometers by 1945. Great strides were made in flood control and water conservation. Civil aviation was promoted, and by the end of the Nanjing decade, through official joint ventures with Pan American and Lufthansa, China's major cities were connected by flights on regular schedules. 5. Restarting revolution in rural base areas since the middle of the 1920s, while still based in Canton, Mao Zedong had been looking for an alternative revolutionary strategy. Mao was born into a relatively wealthy peasant family in Shaoshan, Hunan province. After training as a teacher, he moved to Beijing where he worked in the library of Peking University. It was during this time that he began to read Marxist literature. In 1921, he was one of the founding members of the CCP and set up a party cell in Hunan. 
After Chiang Kai-shek launched his anti-communist purge, Mao Zedong retreated to rural Hunan, where he became convinced of the power of the peasantry. In his passionate, 40-page report on the Hunan peasant movement, which he submitted to the Communist Party in March 1927, Mao described the seizures of power in Hunan by the poorest of the peasants and the landlords humiliated by the peasant associations. He praised how the village order was turned upside down, with women emancipating themselves from their husbands, and members of militias, secret societies, and even criminal gangs revolting and defying authorities and local elites. He also described, with sympathy, the peasants' feelings of vengeance when they punished local tyrants and bullies for earlier misdeeds. Mao provided an implicit critique of the revolutionary strategy pursued by the Comintern and the urban intelligentsia. He did not explicitly renounce proletarian leadership but his report concentrated on the role and the strength of the poor peasantry. He was convinced that rural mobilization was the only way for the revolution to succeed in China. Mao also made clear that violent excesses in the peasant movement were unavoidable and necessary to overcome the counter-revolutionaries and the power of the local gentry. Mao started to favor a strategy that combined agrarian socialism, anarchism, and Marxist-Leninist theory in pursuit of rural transformation. With most of the urban party cells being wiped out by the GMD in 1927, many CCP members became more or less convinced that Mao's strategy, if not his ideology, of rural mobilization was the only remaining possibility, and pointed to a viable path to restart the revolution. Mao gained his impressions and insights about the revolutionary power of the peasants from Peng Pai's Peasant Training Institute in Guangzhou, where he was a student in the mid-twenties. Born to a wealthy landlord family in the southernmost province of Guangdong, Peng Pai was educated in China's new schools and abroad at Waseda University in Tokyo from 1918 to 1921. After returning to China from Japan, Peng joined the newly established CCP, returned to his home area in Guangdong and set about organizing peasant associations to resist local abuses like extra rents, local bullies, and pedophagory by local elites. In late 1927, Peng Pai established Hailufeng Soviet, a revolutionary government council, on the southern coast. The Soviet lasted only four months until late February 1928. After the party's near destruction in 1927, a debate ensued about the reasons for the disaster. In this discussion, Judah, a brilliant military general who became one of Mao's closest associates, played an important role. Hailing from a poor peasant family, Judah attended the new schools, too. He went to Yunnan Military Academy in 1909 and studied military science in Germany and in the Soviet Union in the 1920s. His Soviet experience gave him authority. He agreed with Mao on two major points, that the CCP needed its own army and that the party should refocus its efforts on rural areas. In this context, Mao Zedong told an emergency party meeting on August 7, 1927, 
power comes out of the barrel of the gun. As a result, the Ragtag Revolutionary Army was renamed the Red Army in May 1928. Out of these insights also emerged the strategy to mobilize the countryside to surround the cities. When the White Terror extermination campaign of the GMD against the Communists was unleashed in 1927, the remnants of the Communist Party had to flee from Wuhan and Shanghai. These Communists sought refuge in the countryside of Yangshi province, where hills and mountains in the Jinggong area offered natural protection against nationalist pursuers. The Jinggong mountain range was classic outlaw country, controlled by organized bandit groups. Upon his arrival, Mao had to cultivate ties with local brigands and outlaws who were wary of the communists. Jinggong became the site of the first practical experiments that led to a specifically Chinese path of rural revolution. Under the protection of the Red Army, popularly known as the Zhu Mao Army, Jinggang's social, cultural, and economic life was shattered. By June 1928, most land in the area had been confiscated by the new power and redistributed to poor and landless peasants. The new owners of the land then had to pay levies to the new authorities. Not surprisingly, these radical social policies were met with virulent opposition not only by the landlords, but also by many peasants, including even those who had received plots through redistribution. They were, however, in favor of rent and tax reduction. This poor, mountainous area simply did not produce enough for the peasants to pay taxes and sustain the presence of a relatively large army. On the other hand, the Red Army needed resources to continue the revolution. Increasingly, the Red Army went on to make requisitions that further worsened the relationship between the local community and the communists. After the Red Army's arrival, Jinggong soon became the target of concerted suppression campaigns by militias and armies of the nationalist government. In 1929, on instruction from the Comintern, the current leader of the CCP, Li Lisan, was replaced by Wang Ming and a new group of Comintern-trained revolutionaries sent from the Soviet Union to Shanghai. Should the party focus on mobilizing rural areas, or instead try to instigate unrest and revolts in urban areas? While the CCP was leery of the Comintern's efforts to rein in its internal affairs and to enforce compliance with the political course devised in Moscow, it was unable to rid itself of Moscow's oversight, given the difficulties it experienced finding resources in the poor areas it ruled. The CCP depended heavily on support from the Soviet Union in the form of weapons, logistics, and money. In January 1929, it became clear that Jinggong could no longer be defended. It had to be evacuated. In early 1930, after more than a year of wandering, Mao and his followers were battle-hardened and thoroughly exhausted. They settled on the southern plains of Yangshi province, in a small city named Raijin. Upon arrival, a violent internal party conflict erupted in Yangshi. Mao and his followers encountered a pre-existing local peasant movement unwilling to give up its autonomy and to subordinate itself to the newly arrived leaders. In addition, 
Mao's evolving emphasis on peasant-based revolution presented the Central Committee in Shanghai with an explicit challenge to its focus on urban areas. The tensions that erupted had two immediate causes. One was land reform. Mao advocated a land redistribution policy based simply on family size. He proposed that the more members a family had, the larger the plot it would receive through land distribution. Local Yangshi leaders, more open to local interests, favored a less radical policy of land redistribution based on a family's labor power. A second controversy revolved around the military tactics that were to be employed to defend the communist base in Yangshi against the anticipated attacks by Chiang Kai-shek's nationalist army. Mao advocated the tactic of luring the enemy deep. The enemy forces should be enticed to move into the local area before they were attacked. This tactic had enabled the Red Army to survive in the Jingong Mountains against superior enemy forces. The local Yangshi communist leaders, however, feared that this policy would wreak havoc in their home districts, even if the tactic turned out to be successful in the long run. These conflicts were complicated by the real or alleged existence of a secret anti-communist group called AB Corps, which had been formed by the local GMD to undermine CCP policies by infiltration and covert intelligence work. Mao claimed that the cells of the local Yangshi communists were made up of AB members and rich peasants. Under the pretense of weeding out the AB Corps, open fighting broke out between the newcomers and the local communists. In December 1930, the conflict led to a massacre of the local communists in Putian. Widespread, bloody purges followed and, in the end, Mao and his supporters prevailed. By the end of 1931, Thousands of local Yangshi communists have been arrested and killed. Yet it is also beyond doubt that the outcome of the events clearly favored Mao Zedong, as inner party opposition to his policies was effectively quelled. The Futian incident was the first large scale, bloody, intra party purge that occurred at a time of distress and fear but it also reveals what was to become a pattern. Violent purges to deal with inner party dissent and to enforce discipline and obedience. The issue of party discipline and security was one that received great attention by the leadership. Until the Futian incident, party discipline was handled by the Committee for Eliminating Counter-Revolutionaries established at the CCP provincial level in 1929. As a result of the Futian incident, the CEC was abolished in March 1931 and a new agency was created in its place. This agency was called the Political Security Department and it built a large network of agents who penetrated all levels of the party organization the Red Army, and government agencies. The department was charged to train agents to uncover GMD enemy intelligence, to investigate counter-revolutionary activities, espionage, and counter-intelligence matters, and to solve cases related to espionage, imprisonment, and the execution of anyone considered an enemy. This was a far-reaching institutional innovation. In 1931, as the party prepared for a national congress in Raijin, Wang Ming was called back to Moscow, where he stayed until 1937. 
having repulsed the third campaign of the GMD military in September. The CCP leadership felt strong enough to use the party plenum in November 1931 to proclaim itself the government of the newly constituted Chinese Soviet Republic. Mao Zedong was named the governmental leader, both as national chairman and as prime minister. The new rebel state had a population of about 3 million people. It was based on an entirely new set of institutions. Befitting its new government status, the leadership announced a wide range of new laws on land and labor and adopted a basic constitutional program. In 1931, a constitution was promulgated. In addition to protecting the property of the residents, it explicitly recognized the property rights, cultural independence, and political participation of the Miao, Yi, Li, and Zhuang nationalities living in the region. The right of cultural minority areas to secede was explicitly guaranteed. A marriage law forbade arranged marriages, outlawed dowries, and made divorce possible at the request of either party. Public schools were opened to both male and female children. After Mao had risen to the pinnacle of power in the Yangshi, he quickly found himself under criticism and pressure from the leadership. He effectively fell from power in early 1932. The young, Moscow-trained Chinese communists were critical of Mao, who, unlike them, had no experience abroad and little in the way of credentials as a Marxist theorist. They also resisted his brutal policies of gay warfare and radical agrarian revolution. By the time Chiang Kai-shek took command of the anti-bandit campaign in late May 1933, the communists in Yangshi had abandoned Mao's tactics of mobile warfare in favor of a more conventional defense, on the advice of the German communist Otto Braun. Having learned from the failure of previous campaigns and based on recommendations by his German advisors, Chiang Kai-shek began to concentrate on the construction of a network of slowly advancing blockhouses. An army of 800,000 men built an encirclement of mud and brick outposts protected by machine gun fire. In the battles, both sides suffered thousands of casualties, but by 1934, a total of 14,000 blockhouses and 2,500 kilometers of new roads had been constructed in the combat zone, providing an effective blockade of the communist areas. In early summer of 1934, the CCP leadership recognized that the situation had become hopeless. Eventually, it was decided to evacuate the main forces. On October 25, 1934, the Red Army broke through the first ring of encirclement and moved into southern Hunan. Thus, it commenced its famous long march to the northwest. As it proceeded on its winding journey westward, the long march halted at the town of Sunyi in Guizhou province in early January 1935. A five-day battle with GMD forces over a crossing at the Shang River destroyed half the army. Against this backdrop of losses and defeats, a session of the CCP Politburo decided to put Mao back into power. 41-year-old Mao became the party's dominant leader. He regained control of the army and was able to pursue the policies he favored. At the same time, 
the immediate grip of the Comintern has finally been loosened. The long march continued until October 1935, when the remaining troops reached an existing local Soviet area in northern Shaanxi under the command of a communist, Liu Zidane. The march had lasted one year, during which the Red Army traversed 11 provinces, walked more than 10,000 kilometers, crossed five major mountain ridges, and forded numerous rivers. Only 8,000 soldiers survived the ordeal. The long march was a daring but desperate maneuver. What it showed about the communists' will for survival and perseverance in the face of adverse conditions was taken as proof of not only the validity of the revolutionary cause but ultimately the correctness of its leader and his policies.